Holloway. More than a handful of people have tried to... Note 276. Some kind of ash landed on the following pages, in some places burning away small holes, in other places eradicating large chunks of text. Rather than try to reconstruct what was destroyed, I decided to just bracket the gaps. Square brackets. Unfortunately, I have no idea what stuff did the actual charring. It's way too copious for cigarette tappings, and anyway, Zampano didn't smoke. Another small mystery to muse over, if you like, or just forget, which I recommend. Even though I'm unable to follow my own advice, imagining instead grey ash floating down like snow everywhere after the blast, but still hours before that fabled avalanche of heat, the pyroclastic roar that will incinerate everything, even if, for the time being, and there still is time, it's just small flakes leisurely kissing away tiny bits of meaning, while high above, the eruption continues to black out the sun. There's only one choice, and the brave make it. Fly from the path. Lou dropped by a few nights ago. It's mid-September, but I hadn't seen him since June. News that I'd been fired from the shop apparently pissed him off, though why he should care, I have no idea. Like my boss, he also assumed I was on smack. More than a little freaked, too, when he finally saw for himself how bad off I was, real gaunt and withdrawn, and not without a certain odour, either. But Lude's no idiot. One glance at my room and he knew junk was not the problem. All those books, sketches, collages, reams and reams of paper, measuring tapes nailed from corner to floor, and of course that big black trunk right there in the centre of everything. All of it just another way to finally say, no, no, no junk at all. Throw it away, ass, Lude said, and started to cross to my desk for a closer look. I sprung forward, ordered by instinct, like some animal defending its pride, interposing myself between him and my work. Those papers. This thing. Lude backed away. In fact, that was the first time he'd ever backed away. Ever. Just a step, but retreating just the same, calling me weird, calling me scary. I quickly apologized and incoherently tried to explain how I was just sorting some stuff out, which is true. Bullshit, Lude grunted, perhaps a little angry that I had frightened him. For God's sake, just look at what you're drawing. He pointed at all the pictures tacked to my wall, sketched on napkins, the backs of envelopes, anything handy. Empty rooms, hundreds of black, empty fucking rooms. I don't remember what I mumbled next. Lude waved a bag of grass in front of me, said there was a party up Beechwood Canyon, some castle loaded with hookers on X and a basement full of mead. It was interesting to see Lude still defending that line, but I just shook my head. He turned to leave and then suddenly spun back around on his heels, producing from his pocket a flash of silver. Sishlashik, the wheel catching on the edge of his thumb, connecting sparks and kerosene. His old Zippo, drawn like a point forty four in some mythical western, drawn by the fella in the white hat, and as it turns out, Lude was in fact dressed in white, a creamy linen jacket, which I guess means I would have to be wearing black, and come to think of it, I was wearing black. Black jeans, black tee, black socks. This, however, was not a challenge. It was an offering. And yet one I knew I would not, could not accept. Lude shrugged and blew out the flame. The immolating splash of brightness abruptly receding into a long grey thread climbing up to the ceiling before finally collapsing into invisible and untraceable corridors of chaos. As he stepped down to the hall... A place with dull walls where a pink corpse occasionally referred to as a carpet stretches over and down the stairs. Lou told me why he'd come by in the first place. Kyrie's boyfriend's back in town and he's looking for us. You in particular, but since I'm the one who introduced you to, he's also after me. Be careful. The guy's a nut. Lou hesitated. He knew dance command was the least of my worries, but I guess he wanted to help. I'll... See you around, Lude, I mumbled. Get rid of it, Hoss. It's killing you. Then he tossed me his lighter and padded away, 
the dim light quickly transforming him into a shadow, then a sound, and finally a silence. Maybe he was right. Fly from the path. I remember the first time I hadn't, and a rusty bar had taught me the taste of teeth. The second time I'd been smarter. I fled from the house, scrambled over the back brick wall like an alley cat, and sprinted across the overgrown lot. It took him a while to find me, but when he did, cornering me like some beast in the stairwell of a nearby shop, a chimney sweep business actually, Gallo and Sons, something like that, his focus was gone. Time had interceded, dulled his wrath. Raymond still hit me, an open-handed slap to my left ear, pain answering the deafening quiet that followed, a distant thump then as my forehead skidded into the concrete wall. Raymond was yelling at me, going on about the fights, my fights at school, about my attitude, my wonderings, and how it would kill me if I didn't stop. He had killed before, he explained. He could kill again. I stopped seeing something black and painful hissing into my head, gnawing at the bones of my cheeks, tears pouring down my face. Though I wasn't crying, my nose was just bleeding, and he hadn't even broken it this time. Raymond continued the lesson, his words ineffectually reverberating around me. He was trying to sound like one of his Western heroes, doling out profound advice, telling me how I was only cannon fodder, though he pronounced it like father, and in a way that seemed to imply he was really referring to himself. I kept nodding and agreeing, while inside I began to uncover a different lesson. I recognized just how much a little fear had helped me. After all, I wasn't going to the hospital this time. All along I'd misread my contentious postures as something brave. My willingness to indulge in head-to-head -head confrontation as noble, even if I was only 13 and this monster was a marine. I failed to see the anger as just another way to cover fear. The bravest thing would be to accept my fear and fear him, really fear him. Then, heeding that instruction, make a much more courageous choice. Fly once and for all from his mad blister and rage, away from the black convolution of violence he would never untangle, and into the arms of some unknown tomorrow. The next morning, I told everyone my injuries had come from another schoolyard fight. I started to befriend Guile, doped Raymond with compliments and self-deprecating stories, made-up stories. I dodged, ducked, acquired a whole new vocabulary for bending, for hiding. All while, beyond the gaze of the mall, I meticulously planned my flight. Of course, I admit now that even though I tested well, I still would never have succeeded had I not received that September, only weeks later. Words to find me, my mother's words, tenderly catching my history in the gaps, encouraging and focusing my direction. A voice powerful enough to finally lift my wing and give me the strength to go. Little did I know that by the time I managed to flee Alaska and then to a boarding school, Raymond was already through. Coincidence gave an improbable curse new resonance. Cancer had settled on Raymond's bones, riddling his liver and pancreas with holes. He had nowhere to run, and it literally ate him alive. He was dead by the time I turned 16. I guess one obvious option now is to just get rid of this thing, which, if Lude's right, should put an end to all my recent troubles. It's a nice idea, but it reeks of hope, false hope, not all complex problems have easy solutions, so says science, so warns science. And so Trenton once warned me, both of us swilling beer in that idling hunk of rust and gold known simply as the truck. But that had been in another time when there was still a truck and you could talk of solutions in peace without having any first-hand knowledge of the problem. And Trenton is an old friend who doesn't live here and who I have not mentioned before. Note 277. End note 277. My point being, what if my attacks are entirely unrelated? Attributable, in fact, to something entirely else. Perhaps, for instance, just warning shocks brought on by my own crumbling biology. 
tiny flakes of unknown chemical origin already burning holes through the fabric of my mind, dismantling memories, undoing even the strongest powers of imagination and reason. How then do you fly from that path? As I recheck and rebolt the door, I've installed a number of extra locks. I feel, with the turn of each latch, a chill trying to crawl beneath the back of my skull. Putting on the chain only intensifies the feeling, hair is bristling, trying to escape the host because the host is stupid enough to stick around, missing the most obvious fact of all, that what I hope to lock out, I've only locked in here with me. And no, it hasn't gone away. The elusive it is still here with me. But there's very little I can do. I wash the sweat off my face, do my best to suppress a shiver, can't, return to the body, spread out across the table like papers, and let me tell you, there's more than just the Navidson record lying there, bloodless and still, but not at all dead, calling me to it, needing me now like a child, depending on me despite its age. After all, I'm its source, the one who feeds it, nurses it back to health, but not life. I fear. Bones of bond paper, transfusions of ink, genetic encryption in Xerox. Monstrous, maybe inaccurate correlates, but nonetheless there. And necessary to animate it all? For is that not an ultimate, the ultimate goal? Not some heaven-sent blast of electricity, but me, and not me unto me, but me unto it, if those two things are really at all different, which is still to say, to state the obvious, without me, it would perish. Except these days, nothing's obvious. There's something else. More and more often, I've been overcome by the strangest feeling that I've gotten it all turned round, by which I mean to say, to state the not-so-obvious, without it I would perish. A moment comes where suddenly everything seems impossibly far and confused, my sense of self derealized and depersonalized, the disorientation so severe I actually believe, and let me tell you it is an intensely strange instance of belief, that this terrible sense of relatedness to Zampano's work implies something that just can't be, Namely, that this thing has created me. Not me unto it, but now it unto me, where I am nothing more than the matter of some other voice, intruding through the folds of what even now lies there agape, possessing me with histories I should never recognize as my own, inventing me, defining me, directing me until finally every association I can claim as my own from Raymond to Thumper, Kyrie to Ashley, all the women, even the shop and my studio, and everything else, is relegated to nothing, forcing me to face the most terrible suspicion of all, that all of this has just been made up, and what's worse, not made up by me, or even, for that matter, Zampano. Though by whom, I have no idea. Tonight's candle number 12 has just started to die in a pool of its own wax, a few flickers away from blindness. Last week they turned off my electricity, leaving me to canned goods, daylight and wicks. God knows why my phone still works. Ants inhabit the corners. Spiders prepare a grave. I use lewd zippo to light another candle, the flame revealing what I'd missed before. On the front etched in chrome, the all-red, melancholy king of hearts. Did Lude have any idea what he was really suggesting I do? Imagining then not one flame, but a multitude, a million orange and blue tears cremating the body, this labor, and in that sudden burst of heat, more like an explosion, flinging the smoldering powder upon the room, a burning snow, falling everywhere, erasing everything, until finally it erases all evidence of itself, and even me. In the distance I hear the roar, faint at first, but getting louder, 
as if some superheated billowing cloud has at last begun to descend from the peak of some invisible, impossibly high mountain peak, and rushing down at incredible speeds, too, instantly enclosing and carbonizing everything and any one in the way. I consider retrieving it, what I recently bought. I may need it. Instead, I recheck the measuring tapes. At least there's no change there, but the roar keeps growing, almost unbearable, and there's nowhere left to turn. Get it out of the trunk, I tell myself. Then the elusive it momentarily disappears. Get out, I scream. There's no roar, and neighbors having a party. People are laughing. Luckily, they haven't heard me, or if they have, they've sense enough to ignore me. I wish I could ignore me. There's only one choice now. Finish what Zampano himself failed to finish. Reinter this thing in a binding tomb. Make it only a book. And if that doesn't help, retrieve what I've been hiding in the trunk. Something I ordered three weeks ago and finally picked up today. Purchased in Culver City at Martin B. Redding, 11029 Washington Boulevard. One Heckler & Koch USP .45 ACP, kept for that moment when I'm certain nothing's left. The thread has snapped. No sound even to mark the breaking, let alone the fall. That long-anticipated disintegration, when the darkest angel of all, the horror beyond all horrors, sits at last upon my chest permanently enfolding me in its great covering wings, black as ink, veined in bees purple. A creature without a voice, a voice without a name, as immortal as my life. Come here at long last to summon the wind. And note 276. Explain Holloway's Madness. One of the most excruciating and impudent works on the subject was written by Jeremy Flint. Regrettably, this reprehensible concoction of speculation, fantasy, and repellent prose also includes or refers to primary documents not available anywhere else. Through hard work, luck, or theft, Flint managed to across some of the notes and summations made by psychiatrist Nancy Trobe, who for a period treated Holloway for depression. Page one of Dr. Tobe's notes contains only two words, capitalized, written in pencil, dead center on a page torn from a legal pad. Considering suicide. Next pages are for the most part illegible, with words such as family, father, loyalty, the old home, appearing every now and then in an otherwise dark scribble of ink. However, Tobe's typed summation, following the first session, offers a few details concerning Holloway's life. Despite his own achievement, Sikh, which ranged from scuba diving expeditions in the Akaba, leading climbers up the Matterhorn, organizing numerous, as well as expeditions to the North and South Pole, Holloway feels inadequate and suffers from acute and chronic depression. Unable to see how much he has already accomplished, he constantly dwells on suicide. I am considering several antidepressants, and have recommended daily counselling. Note 278. Jeremy Flint's Violent Seeds, The Holloway Roberts Mystery, Los Angeles, 21361, 1996, page 48, end note 278. Flint goes on to cover the second visit, which much repeats his observations concerning the first. The third visit, however, gives up the first or... In another series of notes, Tobe describes Holloway's first love. At 17, he met a young woman named Elizabeth, who he described to me as beautiful like a doe, dark eyes, brown hair, pretty ankles, kind of skinny and weak. A short courtship ensued, and for a brief time they were a couple. In Holloway's XXXXXX note 279, these X's indicate text was inked out, not burned, and note 279, the relationship ended because he didn't seek the varsity football squad. 
By his own admission, he was never any good at team sports. Her interest in him faded, and she soon be- dating the starting tackle, leaving Holloway brokenhearted with an increased sense of illegible and inadequacy. Note 280, Flint, page 53, and note 280. Nancy Tobe was a fairly green therapist and took far too many notes. Perhaps she felt that by studying these pages later, she could synthesize the material and present her patient with a solution. She had not yet real that her notes or her solutions would mean absolutely thing. Patients must discover their peace for themselves. Tobe, only a guide. The solution is personal. It is ironic, then, that had it not been for Tobe's inexperience, the notes so intrinsic to achieving at least a fair understanding of Holloway's inner torment would never have come into existence. People always demand experts, though sometimes they are fortunate enough to find a beginner. Note 281. Refer back to Chapter 5, Footnote 67, Editors. End note 281. On the fourth visit, Tobe transcribed Holloway's words verbatim. It is possible to tell from Flint's text whether Tobe actually recorded Holloway or just wrote down his words from memory. I had already been out there for two days, and then that morning before dawn, I to the ridge and waited. I waited a long time and I didn't move. It was cold, real cold. Up till then, everyone had been talking about the big buck, but no one had seen anything, not even a rabbit. Even though I'd been deer hunting a few times, I'd never actually shot a deer. But with, well, the football team, Elizabeth, gone like that, I was going to set it right by dropping that big buck. When the sun finally came out, I couldn't believe my eyes. There he was, right across the valley, the buck tasting the air. I was a good shot. I knew what to do, and I did it. I took my time, centred the reticule, let out my breath, squeezed slowly, and listened to that round as it cracked across the valley. I must have closed my eyes, because the next thing I saw, the deer, to the ground. Everyone heard my shot, and funny thing was, because of where I'd been, I was the last one to get there. My dad was waiting for me, just shaking his head, angry and ashamed. Look what you done, boy, he said in a whisper, but I could have heard that whisper across the whole valley. Look what you done. You shot yourself a doe. I almost killed myself then, but I guess I thought it couldn't get any worse. That was the worst. Staring at that dead doe and then watching my dad turn his back on me and just walk away. Note 282. Flint, page 61, and note 282. At this point, Flint's analysis heads into a fairly pejorative and unoriginal analysis of Lunt's. He also makes a little much of the word doe, which Holloway used to describe his first love, Sabbath. However, since Flint is not the only one to make this association, it is worth at least a cursory glance. A vengeance transposed on the wild, Flint calls Holloway's killing of the doe, implying that to Holloway's eye, the doe has become Elizabeth. What Flint, however, fails to acknowledge is that with no certainty can he determine whether Hall described Elizabeth as a doe while he was going out with her or afterward. Holloway may have described her as such following the ill-fated hunting trip as a means to comp in his guilt, thus blaming himself not only for the death of the doe, but for the death of love as well. In Flint's suggestion of brimming violence may be nothing more than a gross renaming of self-reproach. Flint argued that Holloway's aggressive nature was bound to surface in what he called Navidson's Hall of Amplification. Holloway's latent suicidal urges, when Max and Jed insist on turning back, he sees this incorrectly as an admission of failure, another failure, that's increasing his sense of inadequacy. Holloway had over the years developed enough psychic defense mechanisms to avoid the destructive consequences of this self-determined of defeat. What made this incident different from all the rest was that, oh, in many ways, Navidson's house functions like an immense isolation tank. Deprived of light, change in temperature, and any sense of time, the individual begins to create his own sensory, but depend on the duration of his stay, begins to project more and more personality on those bare walls and vacant always. 
In Holloway's case, the house, as well as everything inside it, becomes an extension of himself. E.g. Jed and Wax become the psychological demons responsible for his fail seek. Thus the first act to Wax is in fact the beginning of a nearly operatic act. Note 283. I.B. XX, 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 Sui. XX, 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 Note 284, inked out as well as burned. End note 284, end note 283. Certainly Flint, not alone in emphasize the implicit violence suicide. In 1910, at conference in Vienna, Wilhelm Steckel aimed, no one killed himself unless he either wanted to kill another person or wished another's death. Note 285, Ned H. Kassam, the person confronting death in the Harvard Guide to Psychiatry, Ed Armand M. Nicoli, J.R., M.D., Cambridge, Harvard University Press, 88, page 743, and note 285. 1983, Bui and Maltzberger describes side resulting from two types of imperative impulses, murderous hate and an urgent need to ape suffering. Note 286, Eid 744, and note. 286. Robert Jean Campbell sums up the psych dynamics of suicide as fault. Suicide or a suicide at is seen most frequent to be an aggressive attack at directed against a loved one or against society in general. In others, it may be a mis- did bid for attention or may be conceived of as a means of getting reunion with the love object of there. That suicide, in one sense, a means of relief for aggressive impulses, is did by the change of wartime suicide rates. In War II, for example, rates among the participating nations fell, at times as much as 30%, but in all countries, the rates remain the same. In involutional depressions, and in the, the type of manic depressive psychosis, the following dynamic elements are often clearly operative. The rest patient loses the object that he depends upon for narcissistic lies in an attempt to force the object's return. He regresses to the oral stage and operates, swallows up the object, thus regressively identifying with the object. The sadism originally directed against the desert object is to by the patient's sub- go and is directed against the incorporated object. Now lodges within the ego, suicide not so much as an attempt on the ego's part to escape the inexorable demands of the superego, but rather as a enraged attack on the in- orated object in retaliation or its having deserted the pa- in the first place. Note two eight seven, Robert J- N- Campbell, M.D., Psychiatric Dictionary, Oxford Univers. Itty Press, 1981, 608. It's added for uh, emphasis. Of course, the annihilation of itself does not necessarily preclude the and of others, as is evident in ting sprees that culminate in suicide. An attack on the incorporated object may extend first to attack on loved ones, co work or even innocent bacters, a description which Flint would agree fits all away. Nevertheless, there are also there are subjections to this assertion that Holloway suicidal disposition would within that place inevitably lead to murder. The most enlightening refutation comes from Rosemary Enderhart, who not only puts in his place, but also reveals new about Navidson's theory. Where Flint's argument makes the impulse to destroy others the result of an impulse to destroy the self, we only have to consider someone with similar self-destructive urges 
who, when faced with similar conditions, did not attempt to murder two individuals. Subject. Will Navy Navidson. Comment. I think too often to seriously out killing myself. Will Navidson was no stranger to his side. It sat on his shoulder more often than not. It's there before I sleep, there when I wake. It's there a lot. But as Nietzsche said, the art of suicide is a consolation. It can get one through many a bad night. See Dr. Hetterman Stone's Confidential, an interview with Karen Green, 19... Navidson often viewed his achievements with disdain, considered his direction vague, and frequently assumed his desires would ever be met by life, no matter how he lived it. However, unlike Loewe, he converted his bear into art. He lied on his eye in film to bring meaning to ver- everything he in-, uh, in, and though he paid the high price of lost interaction, he frequently conceived beautiful instances worthy of our time. What Robert Hughes famously referred to Navidson's little windows of light. Flint would test. While both Holloway and Navidson camped in the same dale of depression, they were very different in Individuals. Navidson was merely a photographer, while, to quote, and Holloway was a hunter who crossed the line into territories of aggression. Flint should have done his work if he thought Navidson never crossed that line. In the 70s, Navidson became a career journalist, and ultimately a famous one, but at the beginning of that day, he wasn't carrying a Nikon. He was manning an M60 with the first at Rock Island East, where he would eventually receive a bronze star for saving the lives of two soldiers he dragged from a hunting personnel carrier. He, ver, no longer has the medal. He sent it along with Otto of his first kill to Richard Nixon to protest the war. Unfortunately, when Navison stumbled upon Holt's high eight tapes, he had no idea their contents would inspire such a heated and lasting debate over what in the art of that ace. Despite the radically different behavior pattern demonstrated by the hunter from Sin and the Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist in the house, the hollow tape revealed that either of them could easily have been in the same way. The gl- rescued from that, the t- Lark warned that while paths might differ, the end might not 